there's a big difference between having a strong culture and having the right culture. And if you believe in having the right culture, you understand that it changes. Welcome back to season two of All Hands, brought to you by Lattice. I'm your host, Caitlin Holloway. If you were with us last season, you know we focused on sitting down with C-level execs to chat about how people strategy is good business strategy. But this season, we're doubling down. We're not only talking to CEOs and founders, but a wide range of people leaders, from heads of people to chief diversity and inclusion officers, to really get into some of their core practices, principles, and beliefs when it comes to putting your people first. And I am so excited to be sitting down with Katarina Berg, Chief HR Officer at Spotify. She's been leading talent transformation at Spotify since 2013, where the employee size has grown from 900 to over 7,000. Prior to Spotify, she held various high-profile HR roles at companies like Prem and Swedbank. She's known for creating an environment at Spotify where creative and passionate people can perform at their very best. On a personal note, Katarina has been one of my most precious mentors, and I am lucky enough to call her a dear friend. We met at a conference, I mean, ages ago, and I was instantly smitten. Not only is she an absolute HR badass, but she truly walks the walk when it comes to lifting others and supporting women. After we connected in Vegas, Katarina invited me into her international speaking circuit, opening the door for me for many incredible opportunities, and I am forever grateful to her. But more than that, she's always carved out time to talk shop with me. Whether it's a complex HR issue or walking me through my own moments of doubt in my own career, Katarina shows up. So needless to say, this is the episode I have been waiting for. Katarina, welcome to All Hands. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, let's get started. I'd love for you to share what initially drew you into HR as a career. So I think to be 100% open, transparent, and that usually works uh, the best, right, uh, is what we would in Sweden call a banana shield. It was more an accident, to be to be honest. Uh, I didn't <laughs> really know what to study. I was choosing between three different things and doing HR, what we call HR management in university in Sweden, had everything that I was interested in especially within the behavior scientist area. So that was the main reason. And then uh, after graduating the first job, uh, I really fell in love with the, with the job and, and I, I never fell out of, of, of love. There is absolutely a trend of some of my favorite, favorite people practitioners who have accidentally fallen into this as well. And, and tell me again, what do you call it? Banana shield? Yeah. So you slip on something and you don't really know where to end up. And usually it turns out really well. It's not too well planned. And then therefore you cannot be disappointed either, right? It's only going to be happy surprises. It's, it's so true. I have not heard that expression yet, but I'm going to use it all the time now because I feel like that is the story of my life. The banana shield. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like for our audience to know about your identity before we jump in? Well, maybe it's more things that I don't want them to know, but uh, uh, I get uh, I usually stress in Sweden because I am not necessarily what people mark as as a typical Swede. I'm very direct. I might even be blunt. And uh, when I say the reason for that is uh, that I'm half Japanese, half Swedish, people get me even more puzzled because I don't think that is traits that, that you put in Japanese people either. But uh, that is what I usually, uh, I think, explain my behavior or my way of working and also my way of being, I guess. Well, your bluntness or your directness or straightforwardness has actually been very, very beneficial to me on my journey. So I think it's fabulous. Uh, Wherever it comes from, I'm grateful for it. So let's talk a little bit about Spotify. Spotify is a place that you have called home in your career for many, many, many many years now. You've seen the growth and the transition from literally the beginning to where you are today, which is a phenomenal achievement. But let's talk a little bit uh, about your culture. So you all refer to yourselves as a band, which is a really, in my opinion, a really powerful translation of the Spotify brand and product itself, which I always think though that's the best manifestation of culture when you can really, really market and identify it as your own. And so you, you've even gone as far as to creating what you call a, a band manifesto that outlines your mission, your beliefs and values. And to me, it's very obvious how much belongingness really matters to you all. So can we talk a little bit about this manifesto? How did you go about actually creating it? What does it look like? So, um, 
it didn't start as a manifesto because we did uh, something, I think, exactly, well, 2014 that we called the Passion Tour. And it was more or less uh, set up exactly like Lady Gaga is coming to town, kind of. Uh, <laughs> so you had uh, you had tickets, you had T-shirts, you had the touring kind of on the, on the back of the T-shirt and... Uh, we did a workshop on on you know the direction, the vision, and the mission, uh, the why, the purpose. Uh, that was uh, what all the teams spent the the morning on, and it was uh, facilitated by my team. So it would look exactly the same, no matter if we were in Rio or we were in in Tokyo or we were in Sydney or we were in Stockholm, and uh, they all had a chance then to chew on it and let it simmer and also digest and spit out the things that didn't really make sense to them. And then my team reported directly back to the executive and, and Daniel and, well, Daniel's team of, you know, we get this, we didn't, don't understand that. It doesn't help us with direction, doesn't help us with decision. And in the afternoon, uh, it was kind of uh, crafted in that way that what are the values, what are the playing, playing rules or what are the guidelines that is important for you to have fun? to grow and develop, and also to, to do a good job here. And we had a homepage or a site um, because we truly believe in openness and transparency. So you can follow the tour. You could also see in every location where we have office, where we have our band members, uh, what five uh, values that were most important. Um, not necessarily only what is important today, but what they also thought was important where we were going. And then uh, after doing that tour all the way out, and we started in the most, you know, remote offices and worked ourselves back to the mothership. So that was uh, kind of the, the embryo to what is the bad manifesto today. Give everybody a voice, uh, trust the process, uh, have conversations and dialogue. Then we wanted that to be something stale or something that would be that forever. So for every intraday, is where we bring all the new band members, uh, which is more or less um, 350 people every quarter that we onboard into the organization. We did the passion tour on tour. So they could also be iterating and also pressure testing those uh, values if they are still correct, right? Do we need to leave some because we're already there? And do we add anything? And then last year, 2020, going into what we didn't know, what we know now, we then launched the Bad Manifesto, which is a smaller thing, a smaller piece. And uh, why do we don't, why don't we don't ha have them digitally? Well, obviously we do that. And it's more about, again, how we uh, behave ourselves and, and, uh, and what is important. Uh, and again, we gave everybody a voice and then we massaged it together, which is important to us in a way of what are the direction and uh, what type of behavior do we want to see? What type of behavior don't we want to see? And uh, really manage expectations both be before people decide to join up and be part of the band, but also when they are part of the band. Keep us real. You and your team uh, do such a wonderful job of really pulling people into the culture. It is a co-created piece of work that is is living and breathing. It's dynamic. This is not something that is stagnant or is is published in, and then put on the shelf to sit and and decay. And I, I hear it when you're talking. It, it's a manifesto is something that uh, is is not stagnant. It's not stale. You are including it in your recruiting process. It sounds like you're including it in your your development processes. And and my assumption would be also talent development, uh, yeah. because if your if your values are something that are evolving, you talk about how they are not just the the behaviors that you want to see, but the behaviors that you want to build and grow into the future. So. Can you talk a little bit about how you use values as a tool in the organization? Yeah, you, you're 100% correct. Like everything that we design from leadership development to, you know, drive your own development, uh, um, most of the things that we want to reinforce because, you know, as well as I, the, the, the year 2021 is also the, the year of re, right? Reinvent, redefine, reshuffle, rethink, you know, uh, because it's a lot of things that we now, that we got accustomed to. We, we really need to rethink in so many ways. Uh, and I think it has helped us also pivot. But before that, and, and when we started to do all these things, it was important that it wasn't something that, you know, 
uh, either the executive team came up with or uh, the brand and creative team put together. And right. I think it goes back to a couple of beliefs. One is, you know, when trust goes up, speed goes up. When trust goes down, speed also goes down. And if you are yes. in a very competitive landscape and if you are, you know, truly uh, true to where you started your roots and being a very innovative company, then I think everything that you do with your people processes have to be like that too. So you really, I think there's a lot of companies and I worked in a couple of them that you you talk about, you know, how do you live your values and embody the brand? But here, actually, it, it's, it's part of, of the way that we do things. And the other thing that you also, I think, have to trust and believe is this. When you have, there's a big difference between having a strong culture and having the right culture. And if you believe in having the right culture, you understand that it changes. And all your people are the culture and the culture is your people. So as you are like us in a hyper growth and you add new people all the time into the organization, the culture and the values will change. They will, you know, evolve and they need to do that. And we have seen so many people, so many organizations, so many CEOs and some founders too. You, I know you read the book, uh, Mice to Man, right? Yeah. You, you love the mice so much, so you want to keep it, but you hug it so, so much, you kill it too, right? And this is really, really important. When you do that, you also, you know, put your culture and your, your the development and the growth of your people and your company uh, you don't shift the load from the left leg to the right leg a bit too early, which is a good right. thing, right? Like development should hurt. If it doesn't hurt, it wasn't development. It was something else. So you have to think of uh, um, using and putting your values into action and dare uh, to do that and also challenge them all the time. Uh, so yes. it's, a, it's one of those, you know, hit, hit and remind kind of, of, of work and you're never done. I am smiling because I I oftentimes have used the of mice and men as well uh, the analogy of loving something so much you you cause harm, and it just goes to show how how aligned we are and how we think about culture building and over the years of getting to know you and getting to understand the way that you operate within Spotify and the way you move through this world honestly um, is always so incredibly inspiring and I the the way you share the shifting from the left leg to the right leg, shifting that weight and and really being that astutely aware of the organism, right? Of your culture and how dynamic it is and how it's shifting and changing with time. Understand that it's being co-created. What are you, 5,000 employees now globally? Well, we're close to seven, I think. Oh my good golly. Yeah. Well, three, yeah, 350 new band members a quarter. My goodness. Well, first of all, congratulations on that epic, epic growth. That's insane. Yeah, it is. So you, you, you have to keep up with your culture and your culture has to keep up with you. You don't have much of a choice now, do you? And I, I think that is both, you know, a, a blessing and, and, uh, and also m- maybe, you know, uh, sometimes uh, not so much. Uh, I almost said the opposite, um, but it keeps you <laughs> on your feet. It, it keeps you also, uh, you know, uh, not doing do easy blue copies of yourself. And it keeps uh, everybody uh, trying new things, uh, not just because you get bored, because there's no time to get bored, but right. but it's very hard, hard to get complacent, which I think we all have a tendency to do, right? So I think that's right. been one of the things that I think my team, but the whole kind of band has been very good at. And it's very early days. It, I mean, if, if you talk baseball language that my boss sometimes do, maybe we're second inning. We, we're not like, it's very early days. That actually leads me to my next question, which is more around a specific value. Most companies have experienced some sort of, of fairly extreme either growth or, or reduction in the last year and a half because of, of the world at large and all the things that are happening. And, and Spotify happens to be one of those companies that has just absolutely taken off. But as you are, are both growing and developing your, your product and what you're putting into the world and the impact that's having on people, you also are, you know, that, that parallel path that implies that you are also having to grow and develop the, the, the team, the band. And so, Using your values as a guidepost, I think that in this this time of epic growth for you all, I know how how much you lean on your values. And one value that that particularly stands out to me is this notion of controlled chaos. Can yeah. you talk a little bit more about what that means to you? 
for me personally, I used to welcome everybody on that intro day that I mentioned before. Welcome to chaos. And I was so happy the day when I really believed and also believed that, you know, uh, I could say with 100% confidence, you know, welcome to control chaos. Because in the early, early days when we were startup, it was so much about trying to put the, the, the pieces to in, in, in the right place. And, and at the same time, you know, find you really good, really smart and the right bodies to join the band all the time. But obviously there was a lot of things that we did, uh, like most startups that you start to build kind of the, the house on, on floor four, five and six. And all of a sudden we realized that we needed to get the foundation in, but at the right. same time do seven, eight and nine, 10. And, uh, you know, that is not a small feat. And this is where a lot of, of companies with great ideas, even excellent ideas, this is where they go uh, finding themselves drive down to in the ditch instead of, of excelling. Because right. it, then it's all about, it's kind of all about org design, leadership, and, you know, talent acquisition, which is things like you and I, that's our forte. But if you go back, and especially in the tech area or other areas, this is not necessarily where you put most of your trust in the CHO or the people department. Right. You say that people is your most, you know, valued asset, but but you don't really act and you don't lead by that. So I, I think, you know, the things that was important to us, uh, the company, was to realize a couple of things that Daniel has been very clear on from the get-go. And and one of the questions that we do get then in the intro days when, when I talk about control chaos is this, are we a tech company or are we a music company or are we a media company or what are we? And he always, because I think that is my question to answer, I usually take the micro and like, you know, we are a talent company. And, and if you think about that, well, first of all, that is music to my ear, uh, ears because, you know, the, the things that we do. But the second thing is when you start to really believe in that, and if you have a founder and a CEO that believes in that, anything is doable if you have the right people, you treat them right. And you know, I know that the hardest thing any organization can do is stop doing stupid things to their people and their customers, <laughs> right? Uh, and if you if you crack those two codes, you're home safe. What I then thought with the control chaos, I needed to tell people already before they were part of our recruitment process, this is what you should expect. This is what's going to happen. Change will be our constant, not because everybody says so. It's going to be our constant. It's going to be controlled chaos. We work with polarities. It's never either or it's Spotify. It's always both and. And a lot of things that are not necessarily all nice or neat or professional, all these things that you can expect, we wanted to tell that story over and over again so that people that don't hate change or get anxiety or burnt out of that, that they would not, even if they are super smart, super cool people, they should not apply. So yes. all those things are trying to be responsible, trying to over-index in communication, trying to be clear on the EVP, trying to, you know, make sure that everybody that joins are as equipped as possible of what they would, you know, face when they come in. So they will not be faced. And it is a controlled chaos. And we also quite loving it because we think as soon as it is a bit too clean, a bit too nicely run processes, everything is in order. This is when we also might, we might, I, we don't know, we think there is a risk that we then lose innovation, which is part of our DNA. Yeah, so, so there, there is so, so much in that, that response, uh, Katarina. This is what I love so much about talking with you, uh, especially when we really get deep into talking shop. Things that I heard in there that I want to make sure that we call out for our audiences. One, invest the time in being open and authentic and honest about your culture before people actually become engaged. I say this all the time. It is actually not in my best interest to sell you a bill of goods that does not exist. Let's be very open about this. And we talk, you know, I know that you and I have talked previously about this, this notion of, you know, the company obviously has needs and employees or, or candidates have needs. And it's our job to try to find that point of intersection. It's really important to find that, that idea of this is what we have to offer. This is how we operate. Is that something you're interested in? Because it's not going to be right for everyone. The other thing that I want to talk about is, is you talk a lot about your, your relationship with Daniel here, actually, your CEO, and, and how you 
believe, and, and you've said together enough, that you are a talent organization, which is a really, really powerful thing to say. And something that I know that our, our listeners um, are very keen to learn more about, and particularly for you, Katerina, I think that you are, are the gold standard for what that relationship should look like. But really, I think a lot of a lot of HR practitioners and a lot of people in people roles really look up to this dynamic and this relationship that you have. And I, I suspect that this is probably why you have been at Spotify for so long. Can we go back to the beginning? I'm, I know that, that you two have such a strong and trusted relationship that's developed over a long period of time. That's with any relationship. But what did it look like when you first, when you first met him? What, what about that relationship or that first conversation or those first few conversations could you look back on and say, yeah, this is going to be a place for me? So I actually turned the man down three times and not because I didn't <laughs> understand that this could be one of the coolest, if not the coolest HR jobs out there. It was just a bad timing. Uh, so I learned a couple of things very, very quickly because he didn't give up. He kept calling back. One, he's very stubborn. I like that. He's very, very also persistent. Uh, I like that too. Uh, he's a very, very smart person uh, and I love to learn things. And I realized I would learn a lot of things because he's, if it's not brilliant, he's very close to brilliant all the time. When I actually signed up, he said something that really spoke to me and it was him saying this eight years ago, eight, eight and a half years ago. He said, you know that music changes and enhances every moment of your life. And I'm like, yes. Mm. You wake up, uh, and especially in the part of the world where we live, Sweden, uh, it's dark a lot of, of, of you know, months. Uh, it's quite cold. And he said, you know, you wake up and uh, you might not be your best you and, and you maybe a bit cranky mood. And you, you hear that song when we all know what that song is for us. And it could be different things over time. And you go up and uh, no matter if it's the radio or if it's Spotify, you go up and you crank it up and something happens to you. Like everything changes, right? And then he said, why wouldn't you want to be part of spreading the joy of music to the rest of the world? And I'm like, boom, <laughs> why there wouldn't it is. I? Right. Uh, and there are so many companies that are looking for a mission or a purpose. And uh, I think it's been very clear for everybody that joined this band that, you know, yes, music actually enhances every moment, no matter if you're on your way to a funeral, if you're falling in love, if you're breaking up, if you're going to an interview or anything. It really enhances and uh, it, it's, it's been the beginning together with poetry and other types of culture, you know, uh, attributes, the start of a lot of revolutions. So music is very essential to who we are, to culture, and it has that effect. So I think that was the main reason why I decided like, hey, OK, so I signed up for something else. I really like that manager. I like that journey. But this is something else. So I had to... I had to work with this, uh, with this uh, very young then, back then he's still quite young, but this <laughs> young uh, Donny Leek, and I have never, ever regretted that. I've been faced with a few people who have posed questions like that to me as well, where you just can't come back with a good answer and, and being very rooted in logic, as I know that you are. <laughs> I can imagine what that that feeling was like. And and obviously your reaction, I think, was uh, very appropriate. I also know that our our audience here today, not everyone can find a Daniel. There are, there are fortunately or unfortunately very few Daniels in this world. Can you think of any advice off the top of your head for folks that are in the field or are looking to build a better relationship with their, their CEO or their founder? Any advice to, to help build and strengthen that relationship? Yeah, I would go to the extent to say this. There is no two other roles that should choose each other as much as the CEO should choose his CHRO and vice versa. Because that chemistry and that foundation of values, back to the values, need to be the right, the same. And the way that I see my my job, my role, and what I do uh, on a daily basis is much of being the translator or the effects uh, of the currency of what is he, tr in my case, he, uh, what is he trying to, to build? What are we trying to do? What is the purpose in the company? 
And the way he expressed that, uh, no matter if it's an, it's in my case, a, a very humble, uh, introverted, um, much more of a product person. How do mm-hmm. I put that into programs? How do I put that into processes? How do I create and uh, amplify a culture on what his whole mission is, right? And if he would then have inherited me, right, if he wouldn't be the founder, if I was here when he joined, we didn't make that uh, like repropose so we could also repurpose. I think that would never, ever. So when people sometimes said like, you're lucky with Daniel, I am for sure. But maybe he is my 10th CEO. And I think I've been lucky like that with, I'm not going to say all because that would be a lie, but eight of, of 10. And they were totally different and they were not all men. He's the first that is younger. I've been in all types of businesses, but I have made sure that I choose the the CEO and that the CEO chose me. And uh, taking some time not to evaluate so much the package or, you know, uh, this or that, but more of the relationship, the way that we speak and that we want to do the same thing and uh, that our our value compass is the same thing. Not saying that we are on a higher ground, but the same. Uh, And I think that is important. And then I think you can build that relationship from there. Again, it doesn't mean that you need to see eye to eye or you agree on everything. I think a good relationship, uh, like in your private life, is actually when you can lower your voice, but you can also get upset and a bit emotional or call bullshit uh, once in a while. Right. Maybe not the first week with a new boss, but 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 uh, quite fast <laughs> uh, and keep each other real. I think that is important and really challenge, push back and not just go, you know, yes, 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 boss, or, oh, I think that is wrong. I think that is kind of a very healthy d- dynamic. I would look at it as, as a, a very important uh, relationship in that sense that couldn't like, okay, I ended up with this CEO. You should choose. I think that's phenomenal advice. Uh, I have gotten it very, very right in my career and I've gotten it very, very wrong. Uh, and for many different reasons. And, and to your point, it's like any, any relationship that we have. Uh, but I, I agree within, within organizations, that relationship between the, the person running your, your HR teams or whatever you call them and, and the CEO and, and founder team is absolutely critical. Something that I, I really love that you do is your HR walk and talks. So if anybody, uh, follows you on, on LinkedIn, they, they will see these lovely, just beautifully candid photos of you and and some random HR person <laughs> out in in the real world walking and talking. And of course, the pandemic has has shifted that a little bit. But I'm curious to hear from you. Um, what inspired these walk and talks? How did how did you start those up? Uh, I started with walk and talks 17 years as a part of the leadership training of designing because I love designing trainings and programs. Uh, And I thought it was back then, it wasn't 100 kids. It it wasn't digital at all. It was a lot of classroom, but I wanted people to get out uh, and I wanted them to walk because I do most of my best thinking when I'm walking. Second, it's very hard to see hierarchies when you are walking because you are not necessarily looking. Um, Clothes are also taking away a lot of the typical signs of who's the boss and not boss and who's a, a bit younger and all that. And um, people also tend to think much more freely uh, and be a bit more creative when you are walking. And if you come to think of it uh, too, very few meetings where you take really smart notes and When most people scribble on a whiteboard, I do that because I think I have too much energy and I guess I think it's part of my (laughs) diagnosis, but it doesn't make sense for my team. I'm pretty sure that they go like, I I don't know what you, what what is that? It's scribble (laughs) and I'm going like, it's super clear, but it's clear here. And I think it's easy for me to discuss that. So I started to put walks and talks into all the leadership training to get to know, but also to do, make sure that everybody got time with each other with one easy question. And it started with, how are you doing at work? And then I just brought it into the HR world too, because there is a lot of younger colleagues out there that you don't know. uh, And that I think we owe 
it to uh, to have conversation and take time. But how do you do that in a, in a very busy schedule? Uh, right. So when they ping me uh, on 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 LinkedIn or they ping me somewhere else and they're like, "Can we go for a walk and talk?" You know, it's like mentorship. You you think that you will be the one that is generous and you will give your time and you will you know use all your experience and you know the smartness. It's always the opposite. You learn from all these people. You get new inspirational things and they have put one and one together in a different way, which make you start to think about three and four and five. And uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a win-win in so many ways, but you also get out of the office uh, or at least what we used to call the office. I miss our walk and talks. We are so long overdue. And and my next question was going to be exactly that. Did you, or were you able to successfully translate that into the virtual world over this last year and a half? Did Were you able to keep the spirit of that alive through the, the pandemic or or did they fall off? Yeah. So we've been very fortunate in, in Sweden that we were not in lockdown in that way or we were quarantined. So we could we had to obviously distance and we had to do all the other things that you well, was necessary. But also we are not that many people in a quite big in that it was spacious country. So, uh, and we all kind of, even if we live in the capital, it's, it's, it's a lot of forests. It's a lot of parks. It's a lot of kind of space. So I think I put up on LinkedIn, my walk and talk, it's, it might be 10% of all the walks and talks I, I do. And one of the persons that I, I walk and talk with at least once a week is my, is my boss, um, because he's a, a big fan of, of walking a lot too. So, you know, uh, I kept that up and that also, I think, kept me healthy. You know, I missed my 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 team uh, and I needed to walk back into, you know, better health. And uh, I think we all struggled. The people that said that they didn't in one way or, or another, I think they are either delusional or, or lying for themselves or trying to, you know, uh, <laughs> be strong in a very strange way. This last yeah. 17 months has just been awful to all of us, but there's been some blessing in disguise too. And the walk and talk has has, I think, um, uh, spread in a positive way. And I hope people will keep them uh, no matter who they are or uh, in, in what purpose they use them. But for sure, just to get away from screen and not get screen fatigue uh, and take more meetings and more calls on, on the phone has been really, really good uh, digital too. I'm so grateful that you are able to prioritize and carve that time out. Like I said, not just for for your team and the folks that, that you've been able to to connect with, but really what you're putting kind of back out into our community is is a really lovely thing. So thank you. I know that that every company has had to deal with with its own, you know, sorting out and finding its sea legs of of how do we go from working in in one office or a few offices to the, this idea of remote work or virtual work and and Spotify being a global company, uh, I think that, that you all did a great job of really getting ahead of it. And you've launched this, this program called Work From Anywhere. I read up about it on your blog. Uh, so if anyone out there would li- also like to read about it, uh, you've well documented it, which again, is the, the community is very grateful for. But can you share a little bit more about this program and why you decided to roll it out? So there was a couple of things that we started to talk about five years ago now. First, it was just Daniel and myself. And and, and again, if, if I'm going to, you know, uh, confess to something, he thought that we would be a distributed or remote or work from anywhere company already back then. And I'm like, okay, wait, 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 wait. I don't think our managers, leaders are ready for that. I'm not really sure if our people also would right. really enjoy that 100%. And um, I think most people get will get confused. And what do we do with all our offices around the world? And, and so I saw a lot of problems rather than, you know, opportunities. But then we started to have this as a uh, as a one of the things that we had on all our walks and talks. So every week we debated on what does that actually mean? And one of the things that we started to talk about before uh, COVID was we are actually already uh, distributed first. As soon as you are on more floors than one, you are distributed. As, as soon as you have more than one office, you are distributed. When you start to have 73 offices in all time zones of the world, 
obviously you're super distributed. So why don't we solve for that? The second thing is, okay, why would you do that? Because you can tap into new talent pools. So you could attract people that might not want to go exactly where we have an office. Don't necessarily consider uh, their job to be nine to five or go to a specific building. They yet might want to do uh, work when it's, it's, it's suitable for them, depending on what their kind of, of life look like. And then when we started to think about, okay, so attraction could be good. Uh, tapping into new pools of, of talent could be good. Retaining people that might not want to stay in a, in a location where we have an office uh, and that where we already have a you know a built up relationship. Why would we then lose them just because they want to move back home or you know want to be closer to to nature? Or now everything changed because they're becoming parents and all that. So retention that would be also good for that maybe. And then. I think the last notion that work is, you, you know, it's not a place you come into. It's actually something you do. And then there were no reason for us not to look at what would then a Spotify work from anywhere or anywhere kind of program look like. Uh, so I tossed uh, Alexander Westerdahl and, and Anna Lundström in my team and said, you know, hey, can you look into every aspect, including borders, labor law, uh, global salaries, uh, whatever, insurance, all the blockers, look at them, um, but they cannot yeah. be a reason why we say we need to wait or we can't do that. There's nothing that you find that will sell. And uh, you can't be like me with Danny, like, no, too early. No, not uh, we're not ready for it. And what we heard asking our people and serving all our people during COVID-2 was this because that really pivot or accelerated it or fast forwarded for us was this, we want the flexibility, mm -hmm. we want the freedom, but we also want to come into something to find, you know, that uh, connectivity, that social glue, that tissue, that is kind of community that I have the kind of club blazer of this team rather than another team, which is not a bad team, but this is the team. So where do we do that if we don't keep, you know, a, 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 an office or, or a specific place uh, and whatever we call it in the future? Can we have those kind of, of, of collective places where we come together, reinforce a couple of things, but also reimagine the offices in a different way? We, we used the last 12 months uh, to then use that input from the teams and for, from, from all the band members of, of, of really rebuilding, redesigning the offices in the way that we foresee that we're going to use them. And we're going to keep asking them and keep tweaking because, as we said before, with the values, this will change over time and we will not get it right. And it's, it's important to, to really stress that we are humble about this. We don't know it all. And when everybody's like, but science says this and science says that, science can't say anything because we've never been here before. This is a big experiment. This is the first time we are here. So what you do is you invite scientists to be part of this, and then you are open with your input and your data and your conclusions and share that with other companies that are interested and also have maybe the same type of, of jobs because this doesn't work for every company. This works for us. It's so smart. And, and I am chuckling to myself a little bit here because I too uh, was the one who said no many, many years ago uh, to, to my leadership team. And I held the line and I I, I'm pretty sure that if I had been in a practitioner role at the start of 2020, I think I would have had to have gone through the exact same process that you did. And I, I think that the lesson that I'm hearing here and the thing that I want to highlight or underscore for our audience is really when you are feeling like you are moving very fast and there are so many moving parts uh, to sit down and, in, and take the things that you are underlining as, as problems or challenges and just for two seconds, taking that moment to whiteboard for yourself, uh, even if it's just mentally or with someone on your team to say, how can we turn those into opportunities? And I know, I know how hard that is to do. Again, something, something that we're sharing that is much easier said than done. But, you know, hearing you say you were put in a position to more critically look at all of those blockers with a different lens and a new perspective, uh, mm -hmm. I can imagine how not only exhausting that was, but how rewarding on the other side. 
very much so. And and uh, I I have to you know. The team has been really good, but also how they work with uh, our diversity and inclusion belonging team. So, uh, you know, what are the pros and cons? Uh, what what will that affect? But also, you know, with the the the, the compensation and benefits team, what what does that right. then look like? Obviously, you know, how can can we ensure people if if we would you know like them to be one hundred percent digital nomads? Uh, and uh, can people move everywhere and then? If you want to be, and you say you are, and your ambition is to be a people first company, will they be safe? Uh, and can we provide for them in that way? Uh, so they, there are a couple of things that we can't do 100%, but but the guardrails right. are not ours. It's actually the way that it's set up. But but you could always do this. You can you can hide behind that, uh, or you can go. You can go fast, and you can just be uh, back to being open and transparent over index on on communication with your team and then say you know we will we will do some couple of things that are even maybe close to stupid but we will iterate <laughs> right we will tweak we will make this right with the help of you and it's going to be a dialogue and the things that don't work or if people are getting hurt so we have to pull back on things and we can push on other things but by not understanding that the the train is almost leaving the platform uh, and not getting on the train and not understanding that you can get off on a different station. I think that right. is a, a very, very, very reactive and not necessarily all that fun, but not smart either. Right, right. I, a question that I have found myself asking uh, of, of leadership teams in you know this advisory role as, a, as an investor now, um, a lot over the last year and a half has really been, the, the first question is, is, is this decision irreversible? And the answer to that question the majority of the time, every decision is reversible. You can get off of that train at a different stop. You can always change your mind, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so important for, for whole leaderships to remember that, not just folks in the HR field, uh, but all leaders to, to remember that. And uh, a- another mantra that I say often is be very, very sober about the present and be incredibly optimistic about the future. It's the only way we're going to, to move and develop and evolve together over time. Because if you get either one of those those wrong, uh, it makes things very, very painful. It's not that you can't do it. It just makes it a, a lot less of a fun and graceful experience for everyone. No, but I think that is super important what you were saying, because, you know, being negative, it's easy. Putting out where the risk or, you know, the weakest point, super easy uh, for anybody. But being positive, that is real leadership because you have to be courageous enough to say that I believe in this because you know as soon as you do that people will have the opportunity to pull you down right you put yourself at risk when you're positive and for the longest time when people were positive or nice you were gullible or that was not strong or that was not this and that but but I think everybody needs to rethink that being nice is pretty cool and and being you know optimistic or positive that is true leadership and i think the world needs that more and the thing is as long as you know that you will not get anything 100% right but there are always right. chances to alter it and also you know tweak and 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 get it right and and it's it's a lot about also staying passionate curious about things and yes. and, and it's all about learning all the time 100% I am getting very re-inspired to go out and, and do new work, but that's not where I am right now. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so I think I think that this is going to bring us now to the uh, rapid fire section because we are we are quite literally at the present. Are you ready for the rapid fire questions, Katerina? Uh, well, I, I I almost said I was born ready, but let's see if I'm ready. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few easy ones and then I'm going to go a little bit more challenging. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. What song is at the top of your Spotify playlist right now? So um, right now, my most played song that everybody would understand uh, what it is, is uh, Take My Breath with The Weeknd. Ah, yes, yes. That's a good one. That's a good one. Next question. Looking at the desk in front of you, what item in front of you sparks joy and why? So I have uh, juggling, uh, what do you call them? Do you call them juggling balls? Yeah. When you juggle? Yeah. Why does that spark joy? <laughs> because um, uh, I enjoy juggling. Uh, when I get like uh, antsy, uh, I get up and, and throw balls. 
<laughs> I would love to see that one of these days. And here's here's a fun fact. I'm totally derailing our rapid fire. But did you know that when I was a little girl growing up in Alaska, my parents were actually professional jugglers in addition to many other wild things. <gasps> I can't juggle to save. I can barely catch one ball. <laughs> okay, I, I was uh, my, my mom can do eight, but I can only do three. Oh my God. This is very new information for me and I'm enjoying it very much. <laughs> okay, next next rapid fire question. What is your favorite productivity hack these days? Okay, so I usually say this and people uh, laugh, um, but this is very true. Um, I do everything hard. Uh, and where one and my bi- biggest ha- uh, hack is when when I go and use the restroom, I do that very hard, which means I do that very fast. And I know you shouldn't say this when people hear you, but I do everything very like I sleep hard, <laughs> I, I eat. <laughs> I eat hard and fast. Um, I also use the restroom very, 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 I, I do things hard with pressure. I love this so much. It, it saves a lot of time. <laughs> Don't try this at home, kids, but, but it's true. I am absolutely going to do this today. Yeah. 100%. And this is my favorite question of the podcast, simply because I'm trying to collect all of these things. And that was not on the list yet. So I'm absolutely going to go to the bathroom hard today. Thank you for that. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. I thought that those would be easy and <laughs> they turned out to be far more entertaining than I expected. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it back on topic for our audience here. Um, what is one tactical thing that leaders or HR teams can do today to, to support hybrid and flexible work with their teams? I usually say this, the most strategic thing that you can do is be more operational than you want to. What I mean with that is being really tactical uh, is is saving you a lot of time and and really not trying to be uberly smart uh, or go, I've done this now for 15 minutes, so now I need to work more strategic. I think that is one of the biggest mistakes you can do, if I'm going to mention one thing. I think that's wonderful advice. Okay, this one might be a little challenging, but it's something that is important for me to ask uh, of you today, which is... When was the last time you were deeply proud of something you've accomplished? You are right. That is really, really tough. When was I proud the last time? Um, You know, I think it's one proud moment was, and that is 2015. So it it wasn't yesterday and it wasn't last year. 2015, uh, the team launched our global parental leave. And that made me feel really good. And why it still is one of my proudest moments at Spotify is because Daniel and I get at least one email a week uh, with uh, from parents going like, this was life-changing. Um, and, and it makes me all warm and fussy. And they send the cutest pictures with uh, kids in onesies because you get a, you get a, get a gift uh, box from us with different things like what do you call those headphones uh, so you can go to a concert with kids uh-huh. uh, babies you get the onesies with the you know I'm, I'm part of the band and then they send their the pictures and and that makes me so warm and happy and proud and then I send it to my team because they did all the the, the amazing work with that uh, program so 2015 was the last time I was really really proud I love that so much. And and I will say that uh, when you rolled that out, that inspired the entire industry to rethink what it was that they were doing. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. That is something that I am also proud of you for. Um, so thank you for sharing that uh, with the world. That what, what a lovely warm note to end on. Um, but Katarina, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us today and for always being such an incredible friend. I said I wouldn't get emotional and I'm going to keep it pulled together here. But thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us here today. And and the ask as I leave here with you is just please keep leading authentically. It is so needed. So thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining me on this week's episode of All Hands brought to you by Lattice. I'm your host, Caitlin Holloway. This episode was produced by Lattice in partnership with Pod People, Rachel King, Madison Lesby, and Samantha Gatsik. Learn more about how Lattice can help your business stay people-focused at Lattice.com or find us on Twitter at LatticeHQ. 
Don't forget to subscribe to All Hands wherever you get your podcasts.